Okay, in this video we'll talk about some of the advantages and examples of one specific type of transcriptome sequencing called RNA-seq or RNA sequencing. So RNA-seq you'll probably see a lot in papers. It's the main type of transcriptome high throughput sequencing that's used in molecular ecology. So when we talked about genomics, we said there's reduced representation RAD-seq, there is whole genome sequencing, there's targeted sequencing like meta barcoding. Here for transcriptomics, really RNA-seq is the main one that you're gonna see. And again, what's illustrated in this graphic here is that from that original RNA you are extracting, you can convert to cDNA, fragment it into short pieces, sequence those small reads, and then map those reads back to get estimates of expression level. So here in this example, these regions here are expressed more highly than regions here because they had fewer numbers of reads mapping to them. So what can RNA-seq let us do? RNA-seq first of all allows us to examine gene expression patterns. So this can be relatively broad overall patterns that are shown here through this PCA. So we talked about PCAs previously when we were looking at how you can identify non-a priori populations. You can also, instead of using SNP data to input into a PCA, you can also use gene expression data to input into a PCA to gain an overall understanding of how your different individuals or populations might be separating out in multidimensional space based on their gene expression levels. So in this particular PCA that I'm showing you, this is from the intertidal snails that I work with, and this PCA is based on the gene expression of about 16,000 genes. So I did an RNA-seq study, got gene expression data back, and it can be informative to look on a gene-by-gene -gene basis, especially if there are certain genes whose functions you're especially interested in, but a PCA is a really nice way to get an overall picture of taking into account all of these 16,000 genes and breaking that down into two-dimensional space, how do these individuals differ? And, or if they differ at all, if different individuals from different populations cluster, for instance. So in this PCA, we have individuals from Northern California in blue, Southern California in red. It's the same color theme I've been using throughout. And here in this PCA, I have two different treatments shown here. So here, any individual, so each of these points here is an individual. Any individual with a C in the name is a control individual that was not exposed to heat stress. And so we can see just looking at those control individuals, they are more or less clustered together, southern individuals with each other, northern individuals with each other. And then these arrows that I have are connecting each respective control to treatment. Treatment in this case is being exposed to a heat stress. So what these samples are telling us is essentially how do these individuals, how does their gene expression pattern change, pattern change after they are exposed to heat stress and high temperatures. And so here, even after heat stress, we still see this large separation in space between the Northern and Southern California individuals. So this PCA here is a clear indication that overall the gene expression patterns and response of these individuals that are the same species, but they're located in different geographic regions in California. This also was after a common garden experiment, so we know that any gene expression differences we're seeing are due to local adaptation. So we know that based on this PCA, overall the gene expression patterns of these two populations are very different because they're very clearly separated on this PCA. Another in piece of information that RNA-seq can give us is it can allow us to characterize the transcriptome. So what I mean by characterize the transcriptome is give us information about splice variants. So this is another thing that the genome cannot give us. Only RNA-seq transcriptome data can give us this. So if we have a quick little refresher of splicing. So if we look here, this is our mature mRNA and that was constructed from a pre-mRNA and the introns were cut out. So all of these regions are cut out. We're keeping these regions here to 
make our mature mRNA. We're then doing our library preparation steps, so the fragmentation, the sequencing, and then let's look here at the bottom section here. So these are all of the sequencing reads that we're getting back and aligning to our genome sequence. So in this case, they do actually have a reference genome that they're mapping those reads back to. But what we can see here at the bottom, these sequencing reads are allowing us to identify different splice variants for this particular genomic region. So a splice variant is basically if you're keeping or cutting out some different exons. So in this example here at the bottom for splice variant A, we have three exons that are being expressed. So if we look at our reads here, we have all these three different regions are, being, are mapping to our genome sequence, which means all three of those exons are being expressed. For splice variant B, we only have two exons now being expressed. So they're based on the reads that we see that are mapping to our genome sequence, we can identify that there are two different splice variants here. Splice variant B only keeps two of those exons, splice variant A only keeps three of those keeps three of those exons. And again, this is something that transcriptome sequencing only can give us this information, genomic sequencing cannot. So what are some advantages of RNA-seq? There are several, but one of the main ones that I'll focus on is the ability to detect expression levels in previously unknown genes, or genes that we didn't even know we should be looking at or that we should be interested in. So when we're talking about gene expression from a qPCR standpoint, which we've talked about a little bit previously, in that case, you're specifically looking at expression levels of target genes. So you need to have some kind of target gene in mind to know what kind of primers to design and what kind of region you want to target. Here with RNA-seq and transcriptome sequencing, you're sequencing everything. So you don't need to have any preconceived idea of what specific genes you might be interested in looking at. And that can be really cool because it can give you information about these new genes that you didn't even know you should be interested in. So this is an example from uh, the citations here at the bottom. This is a copepod here on the left, just to orient you, this is very much not to scale. This copepods are basically tiny swimming ants. Uh, this is a female, she has these little antenna, that's her eyeball, and this is her egg sacs. All of these are little, going to turn into little baby copepods. So in this particular study, they were comparing, similar to the work that I do, they were comparing copepods from different geographic regions, from San Diego in Southern California and Santa Cruz in Northern California. They exposed these individuals to a heat stress, and one of the main differences they saw in their gene expression patterns was in these genes called cuticle genes. And cuticle genes, so cuticle is basically like the outside shell part of the copepod. So in diapods, they know that cuticle genes are upregulated, but they really, it's highlighted in bold here at the bottom, the specific role of cuticle genes during thermal stress is not known. So this is one of the main patterns they found in gene expression that was different between these geographic regions but they have no idea why. So this was something they never would have looked for, but it comes out from the data as something that's really important and really different between these two populations. RNA-C can also provide information about speciation and the role that gene expression plays in speciation. This is an example of two different subspecies of crows. They have different phenotypes in the sense that one has this white collar and the other one is pure black. This image here is showing a hybrid zone of the two subspecies in Europe. And when they looked at the potential genetic mechanisms causing this subspeciation and these phenotype differences, when they looked at nucleotide variation, there were essentially no nucleotide differences whatsoever. No SNPs between these two species. And so what that means is that the gene expression is what's actually causing these phenotypic differences in the coloration. And this work indicated that at least in the early stages of speciation, which is what's happening here, 
that gene expression might be playing a really important role. So to wrap up this video, I want to explain an example that's hot off the press. So this is another, this is actually the same person that did the other paper. Uh, he was in my lab, he was a postdoc while I was in grad school. But this paper just came out in September. So it's hot off the press. And it is a really nice example integrating a couple different things we've talked about so far this semester and how RNA sequencing can give you information about phylogeny, about gene expression, and about selection. And this paper is done on this group of insects called ice crawlers. And so as you might expect from the name and you might gather from the picture, this group of insects are found in snow fields and they prefer temperatures close to about zero degrees Celsius. So they're found in some parts of Western North America and also in Eastern Asia. So in this paper, what they did, one of the things they did with the RNA-seq data they got is look at the phylogeny or the phylogenetic relationships by building a tree shown here on the right, looking at these different species of ice crawlers and comparing them. So on the right here, this is a maximum likelihood tree, which remember we've talked about previously when we talked about phylogeography. Remember that each these numbers here at the branch points, those are the bootstrap support. The higher the number, the more confident we are in that relationship. So overall, we see a lot of really high bootstrap values, which means we're relatively confident in these relationships shown in this phylogenetic tree. So remember, RNA-seq can give you information about nucleotide variation. That is the information that was used here to build this phylogenetic tree. RNA sequencing can also give you information about gene expression. So here we have a bunch of volcano plots. So what we're looking at here, remember a volcano plot is showing us which particular genes are differentially expressed. So each one of these dots is a different gene. All of the dots in red in each of these plots are the genes that are significantly differentially expressed between the treatments that are being compared. So that's written at the top of each graph. So we have different species that are shown here at the bottom. That's why there are so many volcano plots. There are different species. And then for each of those species, there are two different comparisons that were done. They exposed individuals to a heat stress and compared those warm individuals to control conditions, and they also exposed some individuals to a cold stress and then compared those individuals to the control samples. So by looking at these volcano plots from that RNA-seq data, they were able to gain information about what particular genes were significantly differentially expressed in these different species following these different experimental treatments. And then lastly, using the nucleotide part of nucleotide sequence part of this RNA-seq data, they were also able to look at signatures of selection across these different species using that DNDS ratio we've talked about previously. And remember, if you have a DNDS ratio greater than one, that indicates that selection is happening. So what they found, this is an excerpt of one of the tables from their figure. And these are a few of the particular genes that had really high and significant DNDS ratios. In particular, this one right here, they couldn't actually calculate a DNDS ratio because there were no synonymous substitutions. Every substitution that was found in that particular gene across these different species was found to be non-synonymous, causing amino acid changes. So this is a nice example integrating several different things we've talked about. In this particular table, they're showing three different genes. These are the functions of the genes. And those particular genes have a high DNDS ratio, which indicates across these different species of ice crawlers, selection is happening at those genes to cause differentiation, which is presumably helping those different ice crawlers adapt to their slightly different habitats.